Good morning. Good morning. Ah, a little better. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. That's better. I trust that you're able to use, and I encourage you to use, our Praise and Prayer Network. There should be copies uh, each month in the back uh, missionary uh, section back there. It gives you a different prayer request each day of the month uh, to pray for our independent board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions. And as Pastor mentioned, uh, Judith Creamer, or Judith Creamer, <laughs> Judith Collins uh, today. And again, she'll be here on Wednesday. Uh, we picked her up at the airport, uh, I forget how long ago it was, September. And she'd uh, spend a little time here, up to New York, out to Canada, down to California, uh, on to Ohio, uh, up to New York again, down to Florida, through the Carolinas, and then uh, back up here. And uh, Lord willing, she'll be turning to uh, Nairobi on the 1st of November. Uh, this coming week is the second round of the elections uh, for president in Kenya. Uh, they had their elections a month ago, and the results were not acceptable, according to the opposition party. They took it to the court and the court to rule that uh, they need to run it again. Um, the conflict is, is that the opposition party says they will now not participate uh, in this coming election because they say there's not going to be any changes. So um, one of our brothers wrote me and he said, pray because pastor, he said, there's going to be riots in the street if the opposition wins. And there's going to be riots in the streets if the opposition loses. So it's difficult. Uh, we saw some uh, good pictures last night in our message from Alex Ware, uh, Alex's trip to India. Uh, we don't realize what, uh, what it's like to live in a third world nation and the, what real opposition is from whether they're Hindus, whether they're Muslims, uh, whatever, whatever ism is involved in it. Uh, so we are most thankful for what God has provided for us. So shall we pray before we begin? Father, we're thankful that this privilege of ours to gather here before your word is upon us. And as we would ask that you would quiet our hearts and that your spirit would have full course to speak to our heart's needs and open our eyes to truth that this your word has for us, that we might be better equipped to know you, to love you, and to serve you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in May of 2016, Rachel Lloyd, who was a student, a college student studying in New Zealand, uh, had a nice visit from her mother. And it was a break time at school, and she and her mom went out to the wilderness of New Zealand to do some hiking. They went to the Tarawa Forest Park, and there was a planned loop trail in this park, clearly outlined. And mother and daughter, got on a wrong trail. They hiked for a while and then found out that they had taken a wrong leg. This one day journey ended up to be four days journey. Uh, Rachel fell, broke her leg, uh, was unable to see after a bit. They rationed what meager food they had along with them. And finally, Mama carried her out to what was near a clearing and able to get sticks and stones and spell out the word H-E-L-P in the clearing. On the fifth day, a search and rescue helicopter came along and found them and rescued them. Um, there's a well-worn metaphor that says life is a journey, but many who walk through this life don't always stay on the right path, isn't it? Life is a journey. We understand how these difficulties go. I got a phone call from a good friend this past week telling me of a mother and father's heartache as they got in their car and searched for their son who was married, had a couple of children, uh, driving a truck, and he never ended up in his uh, uh, place that he was to deliver his goods. And they drove the route uh, back and forth and stopped in all of the truck stops along the way, nothing. You can imagine what was going through their minds. A couple of days later, they did find him. Uh, he was unharmed. Uh, we won't go to the details of what had happened, but you can imagine the heartache that they had gone through. The rest of the details being unimportant, but it does echo these sentiments and the earnest feelings of many parents 
praying for their wandering son or daughter. In, this, in the mind, they envision injuries and uh, addictions and accidents and even death. Parents pray for their child that they may be rescued before it's too late because they've wandered from the clear path. It's true of spouses. Those who live with unbelieving spouses pray for their salvation, or children praying for the salvation of their parents. Why can't they see what they're doing to themselves, we say? Why can't they see what they're doing to their bodies, to what they're doing to their, their own families? What's the difference? Why is there clarity for some and blindness for others? Why do some people see it very clearly, the situation, and others simply can't see it at all? Pastor had mentioned the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's nailing of his 95 theses on the church door at Wittenberg, Germany. And it was a spark that set ablaze. It was a crack that set giant fissures. It was that which moved into the ecclesiastical world that found no repair except in the truth. And what Luther brought forth in those 95 theses set a spark the Great Reformation. In those days, people were living with a theology that saw God depicted as an angry father, where there was really no possible way to be able to come to him and appease his anger, his wrath. The beauty and fulfillment of Jesus Christ as prophet, priest, and king was unrecognizable. In the Holy Scriptures, well, for all practical purposes, they were locked out of the hearts of the people, out of their lives. Some of it because of illiteracy, some because of ignorance, other because of the unfounded belief that, well, if you were given the scriptures, you would not be able to understand it properly, you would mishandle the scriptures. Yet it is in truth, as it was then, the very word of God. And it was a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path, so it continues to be. Begs the question, though, some 500 years later, what does God's word do for us? Alex talked about going into recesses of villages in India where the word of God is simply not known and not heard. And how these who bring this word in truth by the text itself or by the preaching or by their very testimonies all of a sudden finds lives being changed and that becomes our testimony. In verse 9 of our text this morning he says, Wherewithal shall the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. Three things I want to share with you today and we may say, well, what does this have to do with missions? But I'll tie that in at the end if you would wait. First of all, God's word keeps us pure. God's word keeps us pure. The student teacher was checking her student's knowledge of the book of Proverbs and she says, indeed, I want you to finish this. Cleanliness is next to what? And the small boy quickly raised his hand and he says, impossible. <laughs> well, I trust that you know there is no such verse in the book of Proverbs or anywhere in the Bible. It reads cleanliness next to godliness. As a matter of fact, it was a statement apparently attributed to uh, the Methodist leader of John Wesley. Jesus, however, did make it clear that men are defiled by what is in their hearts. And that godliness is not accomplished by foods that are eaten or not eaten, or hands that are washed that are not washed. He says in Matthew 15, But those things which proceed out of the mouth, come forth out of the mouth, from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witness and blasphemies, these are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not the man. Now, I believe in cleanliness of the body. And I'm one of those guys at the end of the day, a hot shower and a good clean bar of soap, just there's nothing better. 
I think you probably all carry around those little hand sanitizer jars. You know, we've got little pumping stations along here, you know. Clean, keep them clean in order that we don't find something. But I also believe more importantly that cleanliness of the inner being, cleanliness of the inner man is most important. But is it possible? Cleanliness of the inner man, is it possible? Or do we say it's just like what the little boy said? Is cleanliness next to impossible in the world that we live in today? Some would say so. And I think everyone would agree that it's getting harder to stay clean in the world or to become clean in the world. That's as a pot overflowing with sin and filth. Facing the visible enemy is one thing. Something that you see and you know what's coming in the handle, but to deal with one whose cunning methods and skill, the wicked one, well, there's no earthly help that is afforded us, is there? And then, how many don't even care about purity? They want to enjoy the unhindered, unhampered life that includes all of the pleasures that are so readily available. And why not? Everybody else is doing it. Well, maybe not everyone. If you would look at Hebrews 11, 24 through 26, Hebrews 11, we read, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused. Moses made a choice. When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, verse 25, choosing choices to be made, rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming, choosing the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Choices are involved in life. Now, I don't think we necessarily face the choices or will face the choices that Moses did, but we do have to face them each and every day in life. To enjoy the temporal, temporary pleasures of sin for this season, or no. Look over in Titus 2, again, 11 through 14. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Sometimes we wonder what is the purpose of this word that's before us. Salvation brings it from God. Our salvation appeared to all men, teaching us that denying choices to be made, refusing to practice what? Ungodliness. Worldly lust. We should, on the other hand, live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now we're not talking only about the time that this was written, but of all times, because salvation hath appeared unto us. Refuse to practice those things. On the other hand, live these things, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope, and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and this matter of purification again. Purify unto himself a peculiar people, people that are his own. He says, they're mine. Zealous of good works. The good things we saw up there. Living soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Those good works. Choices to be made in life. Someone once said it is a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do. No matter how hard it is. Than to face the consequences of not doing it. We've walked those roads before haven't we? We have tasted those things which 
he told us to do or not to do, and, and we've gone opposite to that, and we found out it was harder to face the consequences of what we did. No matter what God says in his word, laying it out, living this pure life, living a life that's pleasing to him, turning and making these choices that are not according to the pleasures of the world, these temporal, temporary things, but looking at them and saying, no, I'm making a choice by God's grace to live godly, righteously, soberly in this present world because it becomes a zeal that God has laid on my heart to live for him. To live for him. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Taking that word, making application of it by what God's provided. Not just providing it as, well, that was my Sunday service, but daily feeding from it. Living the pure life. God's word helps keep us pure. Secondly, God's word helps us to know him. Like verse 2 of our Psalm 119, it says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with a whole heart, seeking him, looking for him, finding him. Pastor Chuck Swindoll had written a book entitled The Christian Life. And knowing and stating in there that our major pursuit in life is pursuing God. Pursuing after God. But he says that this is far from the majority of the pursuits of most people. And in the book, he quotes Shirley MacLaine. And those of you who are old enough know Shirley MacLaine. Whew. She wrote, The most pleasurable journey that you take in life is through yourself. The only sustaining love is with yourself. That's Shirley MacLaine. But that's also a lot of the people that we know. Life is all about me. Just sit down with them for a while and listen to them. Life is about me, my goals, my pursuits, my direction. It's all about me. It's focused on that. Well, Swindoll continues after with that comment, and he says, I'm more convinced than ever that life's major pursuit is not knowing yourself, but knowing God. As a matter of fact, unless God is the major pursuit of our lives, all other pursuits are dead in the streets, including trying to know yourself. They won't work. They won't satisfy. They won't result in fulfillment. Our Westminster Shorter Catechism, question number one. Mr. McCoy? Man's chief Man's chief, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The chief pursuit of man is knowing him, to glorify him, to enjoy him forever. Anybody that we've come across in life, spouses, family members, to know them is, or to enjoy them is to know them. And, and as Swindoll says, the pursuits of the majority, and you agree, the pursuits of the majority of the people in the world in which we live in is not to know God. And they're trying to find some happiness in life, and they do it through every avenue that's possible. It may seem to be a ridiculous statement, but I say it because of the myriad of goals and demands that are upon our time and our talents. Ask somebody. What's your goal in life? Well, maybe it's because of my job or the financial needs that I have or more money or my health or my family. All profitable pieces, but in the wrong order of right. The pursuit of God becomes number one. And all other things fall after that. What if somebody gave you a million dollars in this life? That is, you'd have a million dollars to spend in this lifetime. Wouldn't you want to know that person? I don't know if you're old enough to remember the black and white TV show. Uh, it, it, what is it? It's a millionaire or something. This, this one man, he'd come around and 
He was given a million dollars and he says, you have to take this to somebody, give it to them, and tell them they can spend it, but they just can never tell where the money came from. Okay, That would be difficult, but I'd try. Yet, what would happen if somebody gave you a million dollars to spend in this lifetime? Wouldn't you want to know that person? Wouldn't you want to know more about them, why they did it, what was behind it, how it all worked out? Well, some simple arithmetic finds out that God has given you a million dollars in this lifetime. If you live to be 75 years old, that million dollars would equate to only $13,333 a year. If you live to be only 65, or if you're at the age of 65, that would be $15,384 per year. It tells me that God has given most all of us way more than a million dollars in our lifetime. He's provided for us in abundance, far above that which we deserve. Wouldn't we want to know the one who has given us such cared for us in such a way, provided for us above and beyond that which we deserve. James 1, 16 and 17, you've heard this. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift comes from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variable, no shadow of turning. James says, don't be deceived about where all your good gifts come from. He says they come from a gracious God. And everything that is material that you have, that $225 in your bank account, the clothes upon your back, that car that you'd like to trade in and get another one for, God's provided that too, and the place that you live and lay your head upon and the family that's around you and everything that we have has been provided from him. It's come from him. And since that he has gifted you in this way, why would you not want to know him more intimately? How crude and how crass to say that I've been blessed with such blessings and I don't even care to think where those resources have come from. Paul says in Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So on one hand, he looks and he says, these all material blessings, blessings have come from him. Now Paul says, all these spiritual blessings have come from him. All that we are and all that we have been and all that we shall be have come from the gracious hands of our God. He has given us Christ to redeem us, the Holy Spirit to help us in this life and strengtheneth, strengthening our inner man. He has given us his word for guidance and direction. He's given us his church for fellowship and encouragement. And he's given us the promise of eternal life where there will be no more pain and sorrow and sin of any kind and all the nasty stuff that this life incurs. Why don't you want to know him more intently? Dr. S.M. Lockridge former pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego, served there as pastor from 1953 to 1993. In a very well-known sermon titled, He is my life, he said, of God. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's, he is the son, he is God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in himself. He is unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He's the loftiest ideal in literature. He's the highest ideal in philosophy. He's the fundamental truth in theology. He's the middle of the ages, miracle of the ages. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the leper. He forgives the sinner. He discharges the debtor. 
He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. Do you know him? Why would you not want to know him? He's always been. He always will be. And I'm talking about he who had no predecessor, he who has no successor. There was nobody before him, and there will be nobody after him. You can't impeach, impeach him, and he's not going to resign. We try to get prestige and honor and glory for ourselves, but the glory is all his. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And when you get through with all of the forevers, then amen. There's no end to the description of the one who has not only offered but provided within his word the truth of our salvation and of all of history for all of mankind in the direction of our life where it ought to be. Why would we not want to know him more, more intently, more, more closely, to find it as the great joy of life? Through his word, scripture reveals to us who God is, how he is, and what he is. Once we read scripture, how can we not want to know him more? And I guess maybe the difference is the difference between knowing him and knowing about him. Because there's a tremendous difference. We can talk about the verses of the Bible that we've memorized and committed to memory, and we can go through the service, and maybe, Pastor, that was one way of helping us to realize, as the service caught a little hitch in the road there, that we're not going through a, a formal liturgical setting in order to please God, but that it is what we are offering him in, in that fashion. There's a tremendous difference between knowing him personally and knowing him in our heads. Thirdly, God's word brings joy to our hearts. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. Purity, knowing him from his word, but also finding great joy in the word. The names and faces may mean very little to most of us, but the lives of so many of our neighbors or classmates, workmates, people that we see on the street regularly in my own little community, I know people by names and many of them are seniors and they have their certain times of the day when they do their walks and you can see them and you can tell what they're going to do or where they're going on the outside but we have no idea of the assortment of addictions or struggles of depressions or overwhelming anxieties that are found on the inside. On the inside they may be miserable and afraid and crushed, seeking joy in life but finding none. But there's the flip side to the coin. The things that this world has to offer don't bring, as we read earlier and talked about, they don't bring the joy and satisfaction that people are so earnestly seeking. Max Lucado wrote about a man by the name of Robert Reed and said, who said, I have everything I need for joy. I have everything I need for joy. His hands are twisted. His feet are useless. He can't bathe himself. He can't feed himself. He can't brush his teeth, comb his hair, put on his underwear. Strips of Velcro hold his shirt together. His speech drags on like a worn out audio cassette. Robert has cerebral palsy. The disease keeps him from driving a car, riding a bike, going for a walk. But it can't keep him from graduating from high school or attending Abilene Christian University, from which his degree, with, he earned his degree in Latin. Having cerebral palsy didn't stop him from teaching at the St. Louis Junior College or from venturing out on five mission trips. 
Robert's disease did not prevent him from becoming a missionary to Portugal. He moved to Lisbon in 1972 alone. There he rented a hotel room and began studying Portuguese on his own. He found a restaurant owner who would feed him after the rush hour and tutor him and instruct him in the language. Then he stationed himself daily in the park near his apartment, redistributed brochures about the Lord Jesus Christ. Within six years, he had led 70 people to the Lord. One of them became his wife. At Robert's speaking engagements, men would carry him up in his wheelchair, on the platform, Bible in hand, on his lap. With his stiff fingers, he forced the pages open. And it's not unusual for people in the audience to wipe away tears of admiration from their face. And Robert would have asked for no sympathy or pity, but just the opposite. With his bent hand in the air, he boasts, I have everything I need for joy. His shirt's held together by Velcro, but his life is held together by joy. How could it be? How could it be? Delusion? The reality of what God's word offers in truth, in salvation, the working of the Holy Spirit, changing his life from what we would look at and say, this man has everything to complain about in life, everything to grumble, everything to feel sorry about, and yet this man says, from my perspective, this is nothing. Oftentimes when we come in the church, we'll say, how are you? you know? And say, so, oh, not doing too good today. You know, I had an ache or I had a pain, you know, or this or that or something. We find different things to do that, you know. We find different ways of sharing our tiny little whatever it was. Yet in truth, what God has brought into the hearts of each one of his children is saying, turn your eyes off yourself and look to me, for I'm offering not only purity, but I'm offering the understanding of who I am and my sovereign control over all things, and, and the result becomes joy, a peace. And I guess maybe if you would try and find some synonyms for what Robert was speaking about, it was peace. Or maybe a better de definition of what joy really is. It's not a, a funny ha-ha, but it's a sitting back and saying, what could I ask more of? For we all have limitations, physically, emotionally, economically, you know. One, one way or another, we all have our, our quirks. God's word does offer a lot more for us and many of the things are listed in this chapter 119. Verse 25, he says, it lifts out, out of depression Verse 36, it talks about selfishness. Verse 66, it gives us, uh, us good judgment. Verse 98, it talks about us being wiser than many. Verse 105, our lights, our way in life, and much more. It's really the, the entire word itself. Tying it together with missions isn't that hard. Pastor prayed earlier today that we would understand our perspective to missions. God has called some to go to some places, you know, overseas, and has equipped them to the place where they do learn another language and are unable to adapt to another culture. And he's called some to stay right here. But we can't understand them, and we can't understand us unless we understand who we are and what our relationship to his word is. If they're, not, they're not two separate ministries. It is one. One of the great uh, founding truths that came out of the Reformation came from Luther saying that we have a priest of believers. That each one it was equally saved. The same death about the same Savior upon the cross saved all. And there weren't some who were up like this, some who were down like this. The 
The Catholic Church looked at the priesthood as being, being the vocation. God called them to that, well, for ministry, yes. But they looked upon everybody else as nothing. And Luther says, no. He says, every vocation, whether you're a shoemaker or a tent maker or a farmer, God's called you to that. Be that. We don't understand missions until we understand us and continue to understand. God's not limited in sending the gospel. God's not going to stop all of a sudden if the independent board closes and Collingswood closes and the BP church closes and God says, oh no, what am I going to do? My faithful servants are gone. It's going to continue. Behooves us though to be useful and be part of that work. As we come to know him, come to keep ourselves uh, pure in his sight. Uh, be be sanctified in order that we could be better equipped for him and, and come to find a joy, a peace in who we are. No limitations, holding nothing back. Can we pray? Father, we pause as we've seen these particular verses and so much more within your word. We read passages and we see the men and women of these texts going through situations just like we do. And some, Lord, we, we read of their journeys from one continent to another, being caught up with the crowd and being arrested and imprisoned and beaten and some even giving their lives. And others staying at home in Jerusalem or in Antioch or in, in, in other cities where these churches were planted. And they're just like us. Oh, Father, give us a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness, for your word, which teaches us the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been provided for us, not our own, for it's nothing. We have nothing to offer. But you've delighted from before the foundation of the world in choosing us and bringing us to be part of your family in order that we can know you and live lives that are pleasing and finding the joy and the peace of who we are in you. For we know, Lord, one day we will leave this earth whether by the taking up of the saints and the rapture of the church or, or in death, but only death of this body. And we will stand before you and give an account of what we've done with what you've given us. We pray, Father, we will not be time wasters, talent wasters. We will find ourselves to be profitable most profitable servants for the master. Thank you, Lord, for, again, our time together around your word. May it be pleased, Father, to produce fruit, both now and forevermore. In Christ's name, amen.